questions. Um, so if if you'd like to ask anything, um, please submit them in the Q&A box below and you can do that at any point during the talk and I will fill them at the end. Um, so without much further ado, <laughs> I will pass over to Andrew. Well, Karis, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to reprise the talk, which I gave last autumn. Uh, it's, this is the first time I think I've spoken about the book now for about six months, uh, uh, but still materials coming in. Uh, and so I hope there will be some new material to add to uh, the talk. I'm talking about uh, my last book, The Mount Battens, Their Lives and Loves, a portrait of two remarkable people. Uh, she, when they married, was the richest heiress in the world. He was um, an adjunct member of the royal family uh, and destined for great things. And what I found so fascinating with the book uh, was their very complex private life and the interaction between their private life uh, and their public life. Uh, let's perhaps uh, begin with our first slide. If Karis can bring that up. Uh, I don't see her. Here we are. So this is the cover of the book. And the first slide is the picture of their wedding. And this was in July 1922 at St. Margaret's, just in the shadow of Westminster Abbey. It was an extraordinary society event. The Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII, was the best man. Uh, the King and Queen, George V and Queen Mary, were among the guests. Some 8,000 people uh, next uh, came to the, uh, the wedding. There's George and Mary there coming out of the, chap out of the church uh, next. And this gives you an idea of the crowds that were waiting to, to see this wedding, even though it was, it was raining. It was described by papers as the wedding of the century. Uh, they were very young at the time, in their early 20s, uh, but they were regarded as one of the most glamorous couples uh, of the time. Uh, next, here's a picture of them leaving the reception, the Rolls Royce that was her wedding present to him that she bought off the Prince of Wales, drive by naval ratings. That I can say that they swapped the car for a lorry shortly afterwards and went up to the reception at the family home in Park Lane, Brook House. Uh, some 1,000 guests attended the wedding reception. The cake was so large it took four men to lift it. Uh, and it was an extraordinary start to this uh, public uh, and private partnership. Next. The story of the McBattens really encompasses the whole of the 20th century. Dickey was born uh, in 1900, his father, Louis, was a Prince of Hesse, uh, though from a Morganatic marriage, uh, and eventually became First Sea Lord. His mother, Victoria, was a granddaughter through Alice, uh, Victoria's daughter, Alice, of Queen Victoria. And if you go to the next slide, Dickie was, in fact, the last, last godchild of Queen Victoria. The reason I discovered from the letters that she's looking at them in this way is here he is at the christening. He's actually just peed on her. Um, Next slide. And Edwina also came from an extraordinary background. Uh, she, her godfather was uh, Edward VII. Uh, here is Edwina with her grandfather, Ernest Castle, who was a very rich banker, in fact, the banker to Edward VII. She was named after Edward. Uh, and um, she inherited, her mother died when she was nine. Uh, next slide. So she inherited a huge uh, um, uh, inheritance when she was a young child. Dickie was destined to go into the Navy following in his father's footsteps and also his older brother, George, who was eight years older. Uh, he was also, in some respects, an only child. His older sisters, uh, Louise and Alice, were up some 15 years older than him. Here's a picture of him uh, in uh, Eaton Square uh, outside a family home in a sort of sailor suit. Uh, next picture. And then here's Edwina. You can see a very sweet child, but as I say, a very sad upbringing. Uh, her mother died when she was nine. Her sister Mary was five and she was brought up by governesses, sent away to school, had a rather evil stepmother. And I think if we're trying to understand what made her tick in later life, her um, great rapport with children, uh, her difficulties of being a mother, uh, her um, uh, difficult relationships with other men. I think a lot of it, uh, and her great love of animals, a lot of it can come down to this very strange childhood that she had. Uh, next. So Dickey uh, went from the Royal Naval College at Osborne in Dartmouth uh, on to uh, spend uh, a couple of terms at Cambridge after the war on a, on a scheme run for bright young naval officers. 
And it was there that he became very friendly with two of the George V's sons, Bertie and Henry. Uh, and through them, he became very friendly with the Prince of Wales. Now, at this period, uh, David, as he was known, was being sent on a series of overseas tours to visit the empire, to uh, thank them for their contribution during the war, to prepare him for his role as king, uh, but also in many ways to keep him away from all the married ladies in London that he seemed to have a propensity to chase. And Dickie went along as a sort of unofficial ADC on this trip which took them to Australia. Uh, and they forged a very, very close bond, a bond that was to continue uh, even after the abdication. Next. Dickie was a great romantic. He was always falling in love with, with girls and proposing marriage. Uh, and here is one, a woman called Audrey James, supposedly the illegitimate granddaughter of uh, Edward VII. You can see it's all very incestuous. She was one of the great society beauties of the time. Uh, and Dickey was devastated when he discovered that um, she, he was only one of many admirers and she didn't really want to marry him. Next picture. Here's another one. Uh, the daughter, a rather boot-faced daughter of an Indian army officer, another woman he proposed to in the early 20s. Um, next. And here we reach the point where he meets uh, Edwina. This was in the summer of 19... Uh, 21, he's uh, at Cowes, uh, and they're part of a house party with uh, a very famous um, and rich American family, the Vanderbilts. And Edwina, who's been courted by various guards, officers, and others, finds uh, Louis uh, Dickey as a breath of fresh air. Here he is climbing the mast with his great friend Dick Pugh, but Dickey would do handstands on the tennis court rather than play tennis. He was uh, someone who would aquaplane to dinner in his dinner jacket with his shoes around his neck. He was a very glamorous figure, uh, and he was actually due to uh, go and stay with the Prince of Wales in, on Dartmouth, and she was due after cows to, to go with her grandfather through France. They actually jacked up those invitations and accepted an invitation to go travelling along the coast of France with the Vanderbilts, uh, and it's there that their relationship in the summer of 1921 really was solidified. Next. They, uh, Edwina followed Dickey when he went on a tour with the Prince of Wales to India later that year. And in February 1922, they were engaged. There were some concerns that was uh, from the family. Uh, she came into a huge amount of wealth when she got married. There were some concerns from the Viceroy where she was staying that he was just a fortune hunter and that he really had no prospects. But they came back, they got married in July, and here they are with the famous Rolls Royce at the beginning of what was in effect a six month honeymoon. Uh, you can see the driver Radswell at the back. Dickie loved driving, so in fact, Dickie and Edwina sat at the front, and the chauffeur and the ladies' maid sat crammed in the back. And here they are traveling through France on their way to Spain and to Germany, visiting his relations. I wouldn't say the most obvious way to um, uh, have a honeymoon. Uh, but it was already clear from the tensions on the honeymoon that they were not completely compatible. Dickey was almost statistic. He was a micromanager. He liked to organize everything down to the smallest detail. Edwina was a much more spontaneous, free-spirited character, and she found uh, his control uh, rather uh, annoying, and there were a series of arguments. Next. The second part of the honeymoon uh, took place at the end of the year when they went across the States. This was... Uh, a place that was to be a great refuge for both of them later on as a place of freedom where they were uh, taken um, seriously by the Americans. They were called Prince and Princess. Uh, you can see maybe certain parallels with, with Meghan and Harry here. And here they are uh, meeting the uh, baseball star Babe Ruth. They dined with composer Jerome Kern. Uh, they um, met a whole series of famous people. Next. And then they traveled by train across to the West Coast and they stayed with Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford's house, Fairford, uh, and uh, were introduced to Charlie Chaplin. Uh, the, Charlie Chaplin was looking quite happy there because Edwina, even on her honeymoon, managed to make a pass at him. Next. They actually made a film together called Nice and Friendly, and here is one of the stills from it. Neither of them, I'm afraid, were very good actors, as Charlie Chaplin told them afterwards. Uh, next, and here they are returning back to Britain. Uh, Dickey was due to go back into the Navy. He was a rising star. He was a technical expert. He joined the signals branch. Edwina went back 
to a pretty aimless life as a young socialite, getting up late, shopping, seeing her friends, partying. Uh, and there was a great incompatibility in some ways between their two, their two lifestyles. Next. He was posted to Portsmouth and they uh, took this house called um, Adsdean uh, near Chichester, which they rented and really until the Second World War. They extended it, put in a, a polo pitch. Dickie had become very interested in polo since he had gone to India. Uh, and uh, there was a nine hole golf course. Uh, next. And they entertained. Here are Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Uh, and every weekend, if you look at the visitors books, there were a whole series of people ranging from members of the royal family and senior naval officers through to the stars of, of Hollywood. Next. Uh, Dickie was particularly keen on polo. It was the great passion of his life. Here he is with Queen Mary and Bertie receiving a cup. And it just shows in some ways how close he was to the royal family. Uh, next. So their life really through the 1920s uh, continued uh, uh, like the life of a young socialite. One brief change in it was um, in 1926 during the general strike when uh, Jean, who's, uh, sorry, Edwina, who's pictured here on the left, uh, looking out at us, is, um, went to work at the switchboard of the Daily Express. The woman in the darker clothes, Jean Norton, was probably her best friend. She was the mistress of Lord Beaverbrook. Uh, and uh, Edwina realized that she enjoyed work uh, and she was extremely good and capable. Now, this picture is quite revealing because it reveals something of the different connections, uh, the, 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 the romantic connections that would continue throughout this interwar period. Because Jean Norton, I think, had an affair with Dickey and Edwina, I think, had an affair with Lord Beaverbrook. This was sort of the way that uh, people in those circles behaved at the time. Uh, next. The first child, Patricia, who's only just died, was born in 1924. And in some ways that should have given Edwina a purpose in life. But she really had, had no models uh, as a, a mother. She never really had a mother. And she quickly passed the child across to governesses uh, and continued her life of socializing. In fact, the much better parent uh, was Dickie, who uh, was very close. He'd wanted sons, but was very close to uh, Patricia, and then the second daughter, Pamela, who's still alive, who was born in 1929. Next. Unfortunately, at this stage, Edwina began to uh, start a series of affairs. The first affairs were with this man called um, who was the heir to the Earl of Sefton, a man called Hugh Molyneux, regarded as the best looking man in society. And that was a, an affair that began in 1925 and lasted for about 10 months until he was sent off to India to, to get him out of the way. Next. The next was this man called um, Stephen or Laddie Sanford, who was an American, very rich American, who played polo for both Yale and Cambridge. Uh, and who was on one of the polo teams uh, that uh, Dickie ran. Uh, it, this is a rather poignant picture because this was a picture taken on holiday during the affair when Dickie had no idea um, that his wife uh, was the lover of, of Sanford. Uh, indeed, I think it's pretty clear that uh, she had Sanford's child and it was uh, aborted. Next. The next level was a man called Mike Wardle, who was uh, a journalist on the Daily Express. Uh, and um, next. And then she had an affair with this man called Jack Chacodneau, and that became public. He was an American um, businessman, uh, and his wife actually put in um, a claim to divorce him. You can see it in the, um, uh, in the files. Uh, and this is when Dickie was tipped off about his wife. He realized that uh, something must be done. They had a heart to heart and actually discussed divorce. She came to him in the middle of the night, ostensibly to return a book. They always had separate bedrooms. And they decided then that they would continue their marriage, but that they would have an open marriage uh, as long as she was discreet and as long as she didn't affect his naval career and his relationship with the royal family. And, and that's what happened. Next picture. So the affairs continued. Um, this one is not with the man, it's actually with the woman beside her called Sophie Tucker, who was an American singer. The man beside her is a very interesting figure called Peter Murphy, often um, very close to Mountbatten, 
uh, who he'd met at Cambridge and he employed throughout his life as a sort of counterpoint to give an alternative point of view. Murphy was a communist, in fact, investigated by MI5, and there was always some suspicion uh, about his uh, role in the Mountbatten household. But he was also someone who got on extremely well with Edwina and was a person who could, in some ways, keep the two, two together and their marriage together. Next. The next relationship was with a chap called Bobby Sweeney. Uh, according to Mountbatten's daughter, Pamela, her mother had 18 relationships. Well, I found 16 of them. You're only going to get a few in the course of this talk. But this chap, Bobby Sweeney, was an Oxford golf blue, in fact, a golf champion, um, much younger than her. Uh, and um, uh, uh, another, another of the, the lovers of this period between about 1925 and the Second World War. Next. Then a man called Tony Simpson. This was another case that became public. Uh, his wife uh, sued for divorce in the High Court. Uh, the whole thing was slightly hushed up, uh, and indeed she was paid off. Um, it cost poor Irina thirteen thousand uh, pounds. And um, uh, anyway, next picture. This is an actor called Larry Gray, a great friend of the um, actor Ronald Coleman. Um, next picture. Uh, and this is Paul Robeson. And this was another moment when the whole story of her affairs became very public. There was a piece in the People newspaper in 1932 that she was, the woman in society was having an affair with a colored man. Uh, neither were named, but the royal family said that, that you know, Edwina really must sort herself out. And so she sued the people for libel, and though in fact the story was true. Robeson, who had been playing Othello um, at that point and had often come to the Mountbatten home uh, was absolutely devastated by this, the fact that she claimed she'd never met him. Uh, the whole thing was a complete set up. The case was heard early in the morning and there were no members of the press there uh, and uh, basically she accepted an apology from the people, uh, didn't sue for damages and the matter was supposedly shut down. But she decided that it was best that she spend some time abroad. And from this period, from 32 really to the war, she spent a lot of time abroad. She hated the postings to Malta where Dickie spent a large part of the interwar period. Uh, and she tended to go off with her lovers traveling to the most exotic places. Next picture. Uh, and this was in some ways the, the real uh, love of that period, a man called Le Leslie Hutchinson, who was a pianist. Uh, she kept this very quiet, but that relationship continued until until her death uh, after the war. Next picture. And this was one of her traveling companions. Uh, Mark Batten's older brother, George, uh, had married a woman called Nada. who was a Russian uh, aristocrat, uh, a great uh, granddaughter of Pushkin. Uh, she was a free spirit, a lesbian. She was, in fact, quoted in the famous case, the Vanderbilt, uh, Gloria Vanderbilt um, divorce case, not divorce case, child custody case, where she was accused of being a lesbian. And indeed, um, uh, Nada did spend an awful lot of time in the lesbian clubs of Paris. Uh, and here she is um, with Edwina on one of their trips. Next. By this stage, uh, Dickie had taken his own lover, uh, a woman called Yola Letelier, who was married to a very wealthy uh, French newspaper man called Henri Letelier, who'd been one of the founders of Deauville. Uh, and that relationship was to continue until Mountbatten's death. Uh, Dickie, who was not jealous of Edwina's lovers, found that Edwina was extremely jealous of, of Yola, and she would do some mean tricks like um, when he was coming on leave and about to go off with Yola, Edwina would, would actually sprint Yola away first somewhere else. Uh, and so, Yola, so Ed Dickie was left on his own. Uh, she was the niece of uh, Colette, who was supposedly the inspiration for Gigi, um, the story of a woman with a much older husband. Next picture. Uh, another picture uh, here with Yola and Edwina with one of Edwina's lovers, a Hungarian count called Mike Sapari. Uh, Edwina spent a lot of time uh, on the continent with various um, uh, boyfriends. Uh, this was a, an extraordinary episode in 1935 when she deposited the two girls at a, at a hotel in Yugoslavia in July, disappeared with Sapari. And then in November, the governess um, 
telegraphed her and said, uh, what should we do? It's getting cold here. We've only got summer clothes. Edwina had totally forgotten about them and had to go and pick them up. She couldn't actually quite remember where she'd left them. Next picture. And this, in many ways, was the great love of Edwina's um, life uh, before the war. He's a man called Bunny Phillips. He was a very tall guards officer, called Bunny because of his very long back. Uh, he'd been in the guards. He was a Spanish speaker. I think he was an intelligence officer, certainly was during the Second World War. Uh, and he became, in some ways, a surrogate father to the two girls. Uh, and she spent a lot of the late 1930s traveling with him to places like Africa, the Far East, and Siberia. Next picture. Here she is in Africa with him and a little lion cub called Sabi that she brought back. Next picture. And here is Sabi at Adstein. She had a huge menagerie of animals. She found it much easier to, to in a sense, um, have a relationship with animals than she did in some ways with, with people. She was leading a pretty aimless life, but she was, as I say, a, a, a very free-spirited and a very adventurous figure. And it's extraordinary some of the things that she did, camping out in the desert in the Middle East, uh, traveling uh, on horseback across South America. Um, she, in some ways, you know, was a role model for women following her later on in terms of, of that lifestyle. Next picture. And here she is on the Great China Road in, in 1938, one of the, the first women actually to traverse the road. Uh, and um, you can see her here with um, some interested spectators. Next picture. When she came back, uh, she came back to a new home uh, in London. Um, Brook House, which she'd inherited from her grandfather, was regarded as a rather large and gloomy mausoleum. And so she had it pulled down, it was turned into a block of flats, uh, and she um, and Dickie retained the top two floors. It was designed by Edwin Lutchens. There were panels by Rex Whistler. Uh, you can see opposite the staircase some Van Dykes. Uh, it was an extraordinary uh, building with views overlooking Hyde Park. There were two balconies, one could take 120 people. They could seat 120 for lunch and are frequently did. And looking at the Vista's book, it's extraordinary to see the famous people who, who pass through the doors there. Next picture. She also inherited uh, from her father this house Broadlands outside, in Hampshire outside Romsey, which was to be uh, their country home until uh, throughout their life and still lived in by the family. Next picture. Uh, they retained their close links with the Prince of Wales here they are in Cannes in 1935. This is why he's still Prince of Wales. You can see here he is with Wallace Simpson. Um, and as I say, that relationship continued, though Dickie was very clever to jump ship uh, and get in with George VI when the abdication came uh, and managed to keep in cleverly with, with both brothers. Next picture. Indeed, uh, he was tasked to bring back Windsor uh, at the beginning of the war, who was uh, uh, living in France at the time. Uh, and here is um, here are the two of them on board deck coming back in September 1939. Next picture. Dickie by the stage was uh, commander of um, a fleet of destroyers, the K-class, uh, and his ship was the Kelly, which has always been associated with him. In fact, contrary to, to actually what people think, he was a terrible uh, commander. He was frequently straying onto minefields. He, he wasn't good about obeying instructions. Uh, and this is a classic case where he uh, took a torpedo hit, 27 men were killed. Um, but this was in some ways the beginning of his rise to fame because he insisted on bringing the boat, the boat back to port. Uh, it was a story that was picked up by the papers as a feel good story at a time uh, when there were not many good stories to report as the Germans advanced through Europe. Uh, and it brought him to the attention of Winston Churchill. Next picture. It was also helped by the fact that Dickie, who was a close friend of Noel Coward, um, the story of the Kelly uh, and this, this um, whole episode, later the Kelly was uh, sunk at the Battle of Crete, inspired Noel Coward to write a propaganda film about the Navy called In Which We Serve. It had the support of the royal family. Here you see the king and the queen with um, the present queen watching the filming uh, in 1942. Next. 
The other person whose career was really uh, also um, created by the war was Edwina. She uh, came back from the war traveling. I think it opened her eyes to the need to have perhaps a bit more purpose in life. She'd seen the suffering around the world and she became involved with St. John Ambulance and the Red Cross. And very quickly she rose within the organizations until she was the most senior woman uh, in the St. John Ambulance. And here she is receiving her uh, CBE with Dickey in 1943. And this is really the making of Edwina. The book is in two parts, in effect. The first part, we have this rich, spoilt woman who is constantly um, pursuing affairs uh, and really um, not being a good wife to Dickey, who was absolutely devastated by the experience. And then the whole thing changes. And she, in a sense, comes from out of his shadow uh, and takes on a, a, a really identity of her own. She's learned from him the importance of organization and preparation. Uh, she becomes, she's a very good speaker. She, of course, is very good, like him, at using her contacts. Uh, and um, this is when the private partnership, which isn't always uh, perfect, uh, becomes a very important public partnership. And we see this, of course, much later in some of their public roles, like India. Next. In fact, they're sent off on a, a propaganda visit to the States in 1941. She, on behalf of humanitarian charities and to raise money for war funds, uh, and um, uh, it was thought that, you know, he's a very glamorous couple, his connections or family would help. In fact, he was in Pearl Harbor a few weeks before the Japanese bombing and, and actually in, told the Americans about their poor security and the fact that they should be uh, protecting their planes better. But unfortunately, that advice came too late for them. Next picture. Dickey's rise to power was continuing. Um, he, as you say, was a mentor of, um, uh, mentored by uh, Winston Churchill. Churchill always had, felt very guilty about Dickey because in the First World War, it was Churchill who had accepted the resignation of Dickey's father, Prince Louis, as first sea lord at a, during a period of anti-German uh, feeling in 1914. It was something that so devastated Dickey that he vowed then that he would avenge family honor and himself become first sea lord, which he did almost exactly 40 years later. Uh, Churchill uh, realized that Dickey really couldn't be trusted with any ships in future uh, and that he was probably better in some other role. And he appointed him uh, chief of combined operations in 1941. This was a, a job to basically harry the Germans on Germans on occupied soil, to mount expe uh, ex, um, uh, expeditions uh, to um, test German defences and to prepare for D-Day. Uh, and of course it was during this period that Dickey was involved with one of the most controversial episodes of his career and that was the raid on Dieppe in August 1942, which was a complete disaster. There's still controversy about how far Mount Batten was to blame and how far others such as Montgomery were to blame. But um, uh, there were certain successes when he was chief of combined operations, uh, the famous cockleshell heroes planting um, bombs uh, up the Bordeaux estuary was one, and there were a series of pinch raids to seize Enigma equipment from the Germans. Now, this is a picture taken at the Casablanca conference. You can see here that Dickey, who's been made a member of the Chiefs of Staff as, uh, as the Chief of Combined Operations, is, is really up there with the, the, the main commanders during the war. Uh, and uh, Dickey is seen to have made a success of Combined Operations. Uh, and in 1943, he's appointed as the Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia. The job in Europe had gone to Eisenhower because the Americans were contributing most of the trips, troops. So by way of consolation, Britain was given uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and so Dickey went out there uh, in 1943. It was a diplomatic and political role rather than a military role, uh, but he was uh, beautifully suited for it. He was in charge of the uh, 14th Army, often called the Forgotten Army. And when he went out, he said to them, look, you think you're the Forgotten Army. Um, you're not even forgotten. No one knows who you are. But under my leadership, everyone will realize who you are. And he restores morale. Uh, he deals with the problems of malaria, so there are more troops to actually fight. Uh, and he makes the very uh, interesting decision to fight through the monsoons. And the tide of defeats begins to be turned. Next. Here he is with Monty just before 
he goes out to um, Southeast Asia. But this just, in a sense, brings home the, the, the fact his important role during the planning for D-Day. He brings in a lot of scientists um, who think outside the box. They bring, of course, the pipeline under the ocean, known as Pluto, the Mulberry Harbors, the Fluting Harbors, um, and brings a whole series of boffins into combined operations who uh, prove to be very successful when uh, D-Day happens in 1944. Next. Now, when he gets out to India, he falls in love with this woman called Janie Lindsay, who's uh, on his staff. Janie Lindsay is um, the granddaughter of the Duke of Abercorn. She's a very good linguist uh, and uh, uh, in some ways uh, an extraordinary a a a um, uh, woman. Uh, she's been proposed to twice before she gets to India, once by David, David Niven and once by John F. Kennedy. Uh, she's by this stage married to uh, another member of Mountbatten's staff. Uh, uh, but they begin the affair, an affair which continues until the end of the war. And indeed, they remain friends throughout their lives. Uh, and he left her um, some diamond cufflinks uh, in his will. Uh, and uh, I was able to talk to her son for the book, who gave me copies of the love letters between the two of them, a very profound relationship. Next. Meanwhile, uh, Edwina, who of course was in Britain still at the stage, uh, was having her own affair with this man called Bill Paley, the founder of CBS Television, who was working um, at Shafe at the time. He just had an affair with Churchill's daughter-in-law, Pamela Harriman, and was well known uh, as a, a man about town. Next. So here is Dickie talking to the troops uh, uh, while he's out in Southeast Asia. He was extremely good at uh, um, uh, creating rapport with men. He'd always been a very good naval officer in that respect with the ship's company. Uh, and indeed, throughout his life, though anyone who worked closely with him at a senior level hated him, those who served under him uh, always revered him. Next. And here is Edwina doing the same thing. In fact, at the end of the war, she was brought out to help with the humanitarian work that was required, liberating prisoners from POW camps, uh, making sure that troops got home. Uh, and this, in some ways, was one of the high points of their public partnership. Uh, she was extremely brave. Often she was the first person to enter some of these POW camps, even ahead of troops, uh, and was a great support to him. Dickey, uh, at the end of the war, uh, again uh, improves his, his, his reputation, or rather uh, has a reputation for uh, being rather left-wing, uh, rather pragmatic. There are power vacuums often created in uh, Southeast Asia as um, uh, the previous uh, as, as, as people are, are defeated uh, and various nationalist groups move into that power vacuum. And places like Burma, um, the British were very keen to, 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 to restore power and bring back the governor. But Dickey, I think, could see the way things were going. And he was insistent that there had to be some changes. Uh, and I think this is one of the progressive moments of his life. It's one of the reasons why in 1946, he's asked by Attlee uh, to go out to India and succeed Wavell as the um, viceroy of India. Next. Uh, here is, uh, again, a picture of Edwina out, um, um, going out to visit troops. Uh, again, inspirational figure uh, and a very brave figure. Next picture. And here they are in uh, March 1947 when they go out to India. Uh, the reasons for him going out are manifold. Uh, he was seen to be a man who was very good at bringing people together and making opposing sides work together. Uh, he was seen to be a member of the royal family, which was attractive to the princes, uh, and uh, it was seen to be uh, the sort of person who might well achieve what was in effect a poison chalice, but actually give India its independence. This had long been promised, but by March 1947, there were real problems. The, the um, uh, various factions there, particularly the Hindus and Muslims, were, were involved in communal violence. Uh, the British will to, to govern was going, uh, the troops wanted to come home, the civil servants hadn't been replaced. And so it was a very difficult task. Next. 
But Dickie goes out there, his priority is to get to know the main players, and the main players are, are Nehru, Gandhi, and, and um, um, Jiha, Jiha, no, Jiha. Um, and this is a moment, uh, again, of extreme bravery. When he first goes out, uh, Pathan tribesmen have descended on the governor's house in the northwest frontier. Uh, it's a very ugly situation. And he goes up onto a railway bank uh, and talks them down. And as you can see, Edwina comes with him. Uh, and uh, it's a good example of his charisma and his leadership skills in turning a situation around. Next picture. So here we have Nehru. Uh, they have no problems getting on with Nehru. Nehru being at Harrow and at Cambridge. Uh, there was instant attraction between Edwina and Nehru. Uh, he realized, I think Nehru was a great philanderer, that this was uh, a way in some ways to build a relationship with the Mount Battens. Uh, and though um, the, the conventional story is, is the relationship with, with Nehru was, was only a platonic one and it only began much later, I think I show in the book that it was more than that and it began pretty much as soon as, as Edwina arrived. Next picture. This is Jinnah, someone that they didn't get on with, and I think that was one of the problems. He was a very austere figure, very uh, severe and dogmatic. He didn't give in to the charms of Mountbatten. And I think one of the criticisms that can certainly be leveled at Mountbatten is that he never had a good relationship with Jinnah. He was uh, uh, not totally impartial. It come, when we come to the boundary divisions, we come to the talks, uh, he tended to favor the Hindus and Nehru over the Muslims and Jinnah. Next picture. The other person he had to, to who, whose popular support he had to get was Gandhi. Uh, and you can see here, this is the, one of the first meetings in March 1947, that Gandhi has shown his sign of approval by putting his hand on Edwina's shoulder as they go in from the garden. Uh, and that, I think, helped a lot to, to um, uh, improve Mountbatten's position as a negotiator. Next. Here's a good example uh, of uh, the preference that they showed Nehru. This is them up in Simla. It's a point when the plan was being discussed that would have divided uh, India, balkanized it, uh, and Nehru was very opposed to that. There still was a great belief that they could keep India together. Uh, Mountbatten showed the plan to Nehru ahead of anyone else, uh, and in fact it was changed uh, in the light of his comments. But this was something that, of course, irritated the Hindus in Jinnah, who felt that he'd been given preferential treatment. Next. I've just put this in as just a sort of lovely picture from their family albums. This is Edwina with Peter Murphy, who'd come out to India to work on the staff, again in this role as a sort of counterpoint, putting alternative points of view. Next picture. And here's Edwina with Malcolm Sargent, the composer and conductor with whom she began the fair at the end of the war and continued afterwards. The other woman in the picture is Biddy Monckton, the wife of Walter Monckton, the advisor to the Prince of Wales, uh, and also a friend of theirs. Next picture. And here is Edwina with Nehru uh, after independence in August 1947, when the relationship is supposed to have taken off. Uh, independence comes in August 1947. It's accompanied by a huge amount of violence, uh, which I think could have been avoided. The British take the view that they will announce the boundary changes and the division between India and Pakistan, uh, the carve up after the independence celebrations. As a result of that, there's very little preparation uh, and the British, of course, are not in control. It's left to the Indians to, to police themselves. Uh, and this, of course, was a tragedy. Something like a million people possibly died in the few months of communal violence after August 1947. But uh, Dickey's uh, job had been to get out of India with the um, British dignity retained. Uh, they realized that they really didn't maybe have the forces to uh, police it in the way they thought. Um, but it is a, it is a great uh, tragedy that that was allowed to happen. Next picture. And here is Edwina with Nehru uh, after the war. They saw each other twice a year. She would go out to India in the spring. He would come to Britain in the autumn. And you can see that they're almost like an old married uh, couple there. Um, though there's quite a lot of evidence, which I show in the book, of them sharing hotel rooms uh, and uh, her interfering with Indian politics too. Uh, next picture. Dickie returns in the middle of his posting to India for the... Uh, 
stagnite and wedding of Prince Philip, his nephew. Uh, after his brother George had died at the age of 45, Dickie had become, in many ways, the, the um, uh, parent of Philip. He was the man who persuaded him to go into the Navy as opposed to the Air Force. He had uh, propelled the relationship with the Queen. And there's quite a lot of correspondence in the Royal Archives with Mountbatten and George VI plotting that relationship right through the war. Uh, it was a sort of love-hate relationship, the Philip Mountbatten relationship. Uh, Mountbatten saw it as a way of creating a new dynasty, the Mountbattens, uh, but Philip resented this, this sort of controlling figure in his life. Uh, and so it was often a very difficult one. Next picture. But the relationship with Prince Charles was, was always much stronger. Charles called him his honorary granddaddy. Uh, here, uh, Charles and Anne with the Mountbattens in Malta just after the war when the Queen was uh, out there, uh, when Philip served in the Navy. Uh, indeed, when the Queen went on tour, sometimes the children were left with the Mountbattens. Uh, and uh, I think probably Mountbatten was one of the most important influences on Charles's life. So Mountbatten's role in the royal family stretched through from uh, Queen Victoria right through to um, Prince Charles. He was uh, someone who advised the Queen. He'd known her since she was a child. He, of course, had known Philip since he was a child. He remained friendly with uh, George VI and with uh, Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor. So he was, though he was sometimes seen as a bit of a joke figure by the royal family because he was so pushy. Uh, his years of experience of government uh, made him an important model. Next picture. So here he is with the Queen at Broadlands. Um, he would often uh, invite uh, Philip to shoot at Broadlands. He would go up every January to shoot at uh, Sandringham. Next picture. And this is the last picture taken with Rina. It's in February 1960. She was on a tour of Southeast Asia for uh, some John Ambulance. Uh, she'd been working herself uh, very hard, uh, these very strenuous foreign tours. It was almost as if she had to make up for her misspent youth uh, and this need to, to validate herself and give some purpose to her life. Uh, she'd been warned that she needed to slow down, that she had heart problems. Uh, and one night, just literally the night before she was due to fly to Singapore, she went to bed complaining that she felt a little ill. Uh, her secretary went into wake her the next morning and found her dead in bed, uh, surrounded by letters to Nero, which she'd been reading. Uh, Dickie was absolutely shattered by this. Uh, they had come to uh, 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 in a sense, a working relationship. He was very fond of her. Um, they um, actually found the secret to a happy marriage was not to see too much of each other. Um, but he received the call of her death at three in the morning. Uh, and I think one can see a lot of changes in the way he behaved after Edwina died. She was a great moderator. He became much more pompous uh, and full of himself. I think she'd been a, a breath of fresh air in that, in that life. Next picture. Uh, here is her funeral service down at Portsmouth. She had rather um, um, interestingly decided that she wanted to be buried at sea, uh, uh, which is what happened. Next picture. Nero, Nero actually sent a frigate and actually threw his own wreath of flowers in. Dickey continued his uh, rise as a naval uh, as a naval officer. He'd been commander of the Mediterranean fleet after the war. He had become first sea lord during Suez, achieving his ambition, uh, and eventually became the second chief of the defence staff who was involved in amalgamating the three service departments. He retired in 1965 after a career of literally 50 years in the Navy. Uh, uh, but he, of course, was a very energetic figure. He retained his interest in something like 180 organisations, and he had a whole series of affairs um, after uh, Edwina died. Uh, Yola Letelier was one of the people who used to come out uh, and see him in Broadlands. Next picture. He was also very friendly with this woman called uh, Sibylla Clark, uh, who was a socialite in the Bahamas where he went every year. He's still alive and, and very kindly spoke to me. Next picture. And perhaps the most important relationship was with his goddaughter, the daughter of um, uh, Bunny Phillips. Uh, a woman called Sasha Abercorn, who died uh, only a few years ago. Uh, she was much, much younger than him. That relationship began when she was 18 and he was in his 40s. Next. 
And then I think a great surprise to many, he was also involved with the actress Shirley MacLaine. I talked to Matt Batten's valet, a man called Bill Evans, uh, who said how popular Shirley MacLaine was as a hostess at Broadlands, a highly intelligent, very charismatic woman. Uh, uh, but sadly, Shirley MacLaine has never spoken publicly about that relationship. Next. Dickey uh, continued to enjoy the company of um, attractive women and uh, film stars. Here he is with uh, Clark Gable and Jane Mansfield. Next. And here he is with Grace Kelly. He was uh, rather fancy, Grace Kelly. He was always inviting her to come to Broadlands on her own. Uh, and then she would bring Prince Rainier, which rather spoiled things. Next. I love this picture because we have this picture of him as this rather uh, austere, rather formal figure in his military uniforms. Uh, and here he is showing that he had a sense of humor. Uh, this is on the Royal Yacht uh, and showed that he could send himself up. And, and this was one of the great challenges of the book, that both Edwina and Dickey were highly complex and very uh, contradictory in their behavior. Sometimes they could be very difficult, very cold, um, very full of themselves. And other times they were extremely warm, uh, modest, self-deprecating, uh, depending on who you spoke to. Next picture. So Dickey retired in 1965. He, uh, by this stage, Patricia had, um, I think, seven or eight children, and Pamela had three. And each year he would go off with the children to the family home in Classybourne, uh, which he didn't, uh, Edwina inherited from her. Uh, ancestor Palmerston. And here he is with his son-in-law David Hicks, the interior designer, on a picnic at Classybourne. Next. And here he is with the family at Classybourne. They went every August. On his left is John Braben, his uh, Patricia's husband, who was quite a well-known film producer. He did a lot of the Agatha Christie films. Next picture. And here he is with one of his uh, grandchildren. Next. And here he is again. You see this great sense, very good with children. In some ways he was a child himself um, and uh, he could be very natural with them. Next picture. And this is a picture I think taken in the late 1970s. Um, there'd always been threats in the IRA uh, and he always had police protection from the guard when he went. Indeed, there have been several attempts on his life. In 1978, there had been an attempt to put a boat, uh, a bomb on his uh, sailing boat out in the harbour. Uh, there have been attempts to shoot him with by a sniper. Uh, and in 1979, he was warned by his protection people. Uh, Erin Eve, of course, had been killed that year, that this was not a year to go to Ireland. He couldn't. His, there was a plot to kill a member of the royal family. Um, but Dickey always felt that he was... Um, um, that he should do exactly what he wanted. He didn't want to spoil his holiday. Uh, and there was uh, that the uh, local inhabitants liked him, that he was going to be perfectly safe. So in August 1979, uh, he took his um, month's holiday in, Northern, in Southern Ireland as, as normal. Next picture. Now, this is an interesting figure that I spoke to uh, for the book called Graham Yule, who was his uh, military policeman bodyguard. He was brought in to do a damage assessment of, uh, uh, because of the plots. He uh, noticed that the boat was vulnerable. It wasn't being protected and watched, so anyone could plant a bomb on it. Uh, he also could see that uh, there were IRA people in the vicinity. They'd noticed number plates belonging to IRA cars. And he made this report to his commanding officer. And instead of anything being done, Graham Mule was removed from his duties. This was in July 1979 and, and sent to Hong Kong. Next picture. And the result, of course, was that Mount Batten, uh, uh, on the bank holiday in August 1979, was blown up by the IRA. Uh, they planted a bomb on the boat. And when he went out uh, with his family to lift some lobster pots on the last day of the holiday, they detonated the bomb. Mount Batten was killed instantly. Um, together with uh, one of his grandsons uh, and another boy on the boat, and the boat boy called Paul Maxwell. Um, John Braben's mother was also also died shortly afterwards. Uh, it was uh, it's always been a great mystery uh, the assassination. It really served no purpose for the IRA. In fact, um, turned a lot of public feeling, particularly in the states, against them. Uh, he was never actually, though he was a symbolic figure, he was actually in favour of a nas uh, nationalism 
nationalism in the United Ireland, uh, and in fact offered himself as an intermediary. Uh, and um, eight people who were supposedly involved in the assassination, only one of them went to prison and he was one of the first people released under the Good Friday Agreement. Another person who was charged but not convicted, uh, a man called Francis McGurl, uh, died in a mysterious tractor accident, which a tractor overturned and crushed him to death at a time when the SES were on manoeuvres in the area. But I think there's a great mystery there. Why was Graham Ewell removed? Why wasn't his boat uh, um, protected? Why were the Garda watching him from the cliffs and not really properly trained? Uh, I think those files have all been closed uh, and one wonders why. Next picture. This is a picture that was all left of, of um, the boat at the end. Next picture. Some rather tragic pictures here. Next picture. And this is the funeral that he'd been planning for years. I mean, the, there's something like seven or eight huge files in the National Archives relating to this with his instructions about how many French troops there should be and what the Royal Marines should be doing and etc. Uh, it was, I suppose, the biggest funeral since Winston Churchill for a commoner. Next picture. And here is Prince Charles giving the address uh, at the service in 1979. Next picture. Uh, and this is the man, Patrick Mahone, who was sentenced to prison for um, uh, killing Mountbatten. He was actually picked up before the bomb went off and convicted on forensic evidence that he had um, green paint from the boat and, and um, detonator on his finger. He was one of the IRA's chief bomb, bomb makers. Next picture. And here's Francis McGurl going into court during the trial in November 1979. Next picture. Now, I don't know if you can read this, but this is in some ways where the story takes on a slightly more sinister element. And it's uh, reproduced in my, one of the last chapters of the book called Rumours. During the course of my research, I discovered uh, I got made freedom of information requests to the FBI. And one of the files that uh, I um, discovered uh, was this one, showing that the FBI had kept a file on Mount Batten from 1944 with a series of informants. Now, the fact that people have said things to the FBI doesn't mean that they're true, but we, we've got several people here. One uh, is a woman called Lady Desai, who was a society columnist and friend of the royal family. Another was an intelligence officer called John Grumbach. Another was married to the um, future uh, Secretary of State for India, a woman called Lady Lestall. And they all told the same story. Uh, and I'll read um, the quote here from the files. The files, by the way, were kept by the FBI right through the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and as I requested them, I discovered that they were being destroyed after I requested them, which made me a little bit suspicious. Um, one of the lines says, he's been intimate of the British Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary and her ladies in waiting. Uh, sorry, she, she, ladies decides, has been intimate of the British Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary and her ladies in waiting. She states that in those circles, Lord Louis Mountbatten and his wife are considered people of uh, extremely low morals. She states that Lord Louis Mountbatten was known to be a homosexual with a perversion for young boys. Now, that's certainly not anything one's read in any of the official uh, books on Mountbatten. But as I dug, uh, other stories began to emerge of his interest in young boys. I, introduced, I interviewed two boys who'd been in a boys' home in Belfast, Kinkora, who were brought across in August 1977 uh, and claimed to have been abused by Matt Batten, able to describe Classy Bourne very carefully uh, and indeed him. And indeed, I talked to a member of the royal family and she admitted that that episode did ring true. Um, there are stories going back to a chauffeur in the Second World War, taking him to meet young children. Uh, certainly what's clear from the people that I interviewed, and there were dozens, uh, Matt Batten was bisexual, he'd had homosexual relationships all his life and actually been very open about them. He, a lot of them were people in the Navy who, of course, kept, kept quiet, uh, but even senior naval officers knew what was going on. So, for example, when he went to Malta in 1948, the commanding officer told Matt Batten's chauffeur that he should know where the male brothel was because Matt Batten would want to go there. Uh, indeed, I interviewed a man still alive who was Matt Batten's lover for the last seven years of his life. So this is a completely different picture of Mountbatten, uh, a man who had a dark secret at the centre of his life. It may explain perhaps some of the problems in the marriage. A man who was breaking the law because, of course, homosexuality was illegal until 1967. And it was an offence to be a member of the armed forces uh, until this century. 
a man who saw many of his friends being sent to prison, who uh, himself was responsible for dismissing people from the service for his own um, sexual orientation. So I think this was important. It's been controversial, but it does give a completely different slant on Mountbatten. Uh, next picture. Uh, and this is something that I found in the archives that I think might explain it. This is a picture of a man called Frederick Lawrence Long. He was the man who married Mountbatten in 1922. He was, uh, had been in the Navy. He came out and was a, a private tutor. Uh, and he tutored Mountbatten in Bridport in the summer of uh, 1915, 1916, uh, after, uh, 1916, after Mountbatten had been um, ill, had missed various lessons. And what I found in the archives, uh, which had clearly been heavily weeded, uh, the Mountbatten known archives, were uh, a series of letters from uh, Long to Mountbatten, which are in effect love letters. Um, uh, and I think my inference is that uh, Mountbatten himself had been abused as a teenager by Long, uh, and that may perhaps explain uh, his own behaviour in later life. But I don't think th this rather dark side to Mountbatten's life should take away from his huge achievement uh, in public life, his great public service. And I think we should certainly also, in the book, remember the extraordinary service that uh, Edwina Mountbatten herself gave. Now that's brought us up to 12, probably a good time to stop, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just check if we've got any. Oh, haven't got any yet. Uh, this is the time if anyone wants to answer anything, just pop them in the Q and A box. And and you can always contact me um, directly if you just Google my name. You'll get emails and phone numbers um, uh, from the agency, literary agency site. One of the things I love about giving talks, uh, particularly uh, in person, is there's often someone in the audience, and this happened when I gave the talk at the Royal Overseas League, who will come up with uh, a story. Uh, connected with the Mountbatten's. In that case, it was um, someone whose, uh, in a sense, partner was the daughter of uh, a man called Michael Leahy, who was a well-known sex addiction doctor in 1930s in London, uh, who treated Edwina for sex addiction. Uh, we got no questions? No questions. So, so. Well, Happy to wrap it up here. I, all I can do is recommend if you want to know more, um, the book has just come out in paperback uh, and um, uh, uh, there's a lot more detail there. I've rather stressed the, the, the love life in this talk, but there's a lot there on their time in India and the public roles that they played. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. <laughs> Goodbye. Yes, bye bye.